Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. This week, our topic is work from home, BYOD, zero trust architecture. That is a mouthful, but I did want to talk about zero trust architecture, specifically focusing on bringing your own device and how do you think about that and what type of policies you should be implementing to allow productivity, but still have your policies, your security policies enforced. And so, you know, one of the things a lot of organizations that I talk to, that Adam talks to, you know, they're looking still to adopt these BYOD devices into their organizations, or they're trying to expand some work from home policies and allowing people to bring their own devices or use their devices outside of the corporate networks. And obviously the pandemic has had a huge impact on moving the needle on that essentially. But also I think, This younger generation and the workforce that is coming up is very different than the generation that has been around. And there's a demand for remote jobs, for being able to work when you want to work, how you want to work, um, on what device you want to work on. And my guess, especially looking at a lot of LinkedIn job postings, is that this is something that you're going to have to offer for uh, your company has a benefit, really. You know, if you, you're not going to be able to recruit really good talent unless this is available for a lot of different jobs that actually can work from home. Now, I'm not talking about like jobs that require you to be on site, like a factory worker who's making something within the actual physical building, but jobs that require you to sit from home and, you know, call centers, all that stuff, you can do that from home now. Like, there's no reason to bring them in. So, With that in mind, really, that's where I wanted to scope this conversation is, you know, how do you provide access to M365 applications, as well as in what I would say, any type of single sign on application to a cloud provider, like specifically Azure Federated applications, or if you're using another IDP, you know, those applications, how do you provide secure access to those on devices that you may or may not manage? Um, outside of your work environment. And what I found was that I kind of wanted to share with our listeners because this was new to me. Someone shared it to me within the uh, technical community that I sit in at Microsoft is Microsoft Middle East Africa, which is one of our major geographical organizational units. They developed a blueprint and I found a blog that was written by a security technical specialist. So someone that is a peer to me over in that particular organization written for the governments that they're probably trying to consult with or sell our products to. And it's a step-by-step blueprint that gives you configuration guidance, very specific prescriptive guidance for how to configure Azure Active Directory into an M365 for bring your own devices in a zero trust configuration. And, you know, Adam and I, you and I were talking before on the pre-show about this and we're going through this. And if you do take a look at the documentation, which highly recommend that you do, it is a little bit older. So there are some things that aren't branded correctly there. They may not be the same screenshots. You know, this was written in 2021. So, some things have changed since then. So it's not by any means like a one shop stop where you just kind of look at this and I can go through it, but it is an excellent place to start for anyone who is kind of beginning their journey in maybe allowing users to bring their own devices. Or even if you're mature in this space already, I went through this and I learned a ton of things and I'm like, this is a good idea. This is a good idea. So you're going to pick up things that you may not think about and you'll want to implement them because they're just good things to do. 
So if you go through this document, it groups the policies into three different categories. And we'll, we'll talk about it because I think I have some opinions about it. And that kind of goes to show where I just mentioned, this is not your one-stop shop because I wouldn't even say this is the exact guidance I would do at, at a company, but very good reference, right? So the good stuff, we'll start there. So in the good, it is the highest level of residual risk and it does require at least a minimum of M365 E3 or, yeah, I would say M365 E3 because you're going to need EMS E3 as well as probably some of the enterprise windows, although not absolutely necessary looking at this configuration. I I think you might be able to leave that off if you're not an enterprise windows customer, Um, but you're going to need office obviously because that's where most people start. And then it does require the the EMS stuff. So everything in here uh, is probably doable with M365 F3 as well. Yeah. So this is by far the the least amount of uh, configuration required and the least amount of licensing. And it does give you the minimum level of configurations that you know they think as well as I think that organizations should be meeting as far as BYOD. Um, It assumes that you allow browser-based access from a PC or Mac, like a BYOD PC or Mac, and you're allowing approved apps on mobile devices in order to access your data. So Teams on a mobile device or SharePoint or OneDrive. And then you're MFAing and restricting session controls within Exchange and SharePoint. And so specifically, you're going to limit Office and web apps only to um, for PC and Mac. So no client apps are able to access that. You're using approved client apps only on mobile devices, which you can do through conditional access. Like you have to use the Outlook app if you're going to access our company email. And you can't use the native app. And there's good reason for that because, you know, you can implement a lot of more, a lot more control if you're using the Outlook app, like information protection. You can't do that through the native app. Conditional access with app enforced restrictions on PC and Mac, conditional access for approved client apps, um, app protection policies. This is done, it's really called, um, uh, application management where you are not only managing the session, the device, but you're managing the data within the application. And so you can require read only, like not being able to copy and paste stuff from your Outlook app to like the notepad on your iOS device, something like that. So you're protecting the data within the sandbox of that application. So that's also minimum. And then curiously, they put app configuration policies on this. And that's not something that I've done very often, but you can use management to say, not only are you going to use Outlook, you're going to use Outlook with these settings already configured. So I could force you to not be able to sync your Outlook clients to your native phone contacts, or I could require you to have certain configurations within there. I can't remember all of them, but there are things that you can do to say, okay, not only can you only access email from this device, from this application, from Outlook, you also can't copy and paste anything out of it. And I'm going to deliver it in this configuration and configure the app, not only your device, but also just this app. And so that's their good controls. That's the minimum that they consider that most organizations should have. One, one thing here that isn't really well explained in this documentation, but just so you know what it is, there's a mention of app enforced restrictions for PC and Mac. What that is, is when you are accessing, say like outlook web app through your browser, or you're accessing SharePoint online through a browser 
it will detect and say, hey, you're not on a managed device, so you can't download email attachments, or you can't download files from SharePoint. You can work with them right here in the browser, in Word, in the browser, Excel in the browser, save them to your OneDrive. That's all fine. You just can't download that copy to your local machine. And so this is, I mean, this is relatively good outside of like really regulated scenarios because on a Mac or PC, basically you don't take any local files with you. No, it's not VDI in the sense that yes, some of the text is actually being delivered to your browser. And if you're really, really, you know, like hardcore trying to find a way to break into it, maybe you can copy and paste it and lift it out of the browser versus with VDI because it's a screenshot. It's harder. Although now with, you know, there's a lot of really good OCR like built into iOS where even that's, you know, makes it pretty easy to screenshot something and copy and paste it. But, um, I mean, overall, these are reasonably strong controls. I, I mean, and, and what, it, what we like about all of this is just that it gives you a starting point. It gives you a blueprint. It literally says, go to Azure AD, click these things, do this. And it's a great way if you're trying to kind of learn how to do this to implement it and then go see what happens and then go from there. And I always point out with Azure AD, it's really trivial to scope something to like one test user and see what happens. You don't have to apply it to your whole org at first. It's trivial to assign this to one user, one group, go see what happens. So most of this stuff is not tenant wide anyway. So definitely um, reasonable to, to poke at this, but I, I think this is a, a good baseline and I believe for, well, I was going to say, this is how Microsoft is configured on for the browser-based access, yes. This is like how Microsoft Corporate is actually configured. We do have those app-enforced restrictions. So I can actually go read my email from any unmanaged device, you know, from the quote-unquote grandma's PC, and I will get that scenario where I can't download attachments. On mobile devices, we we actually go a step farther than this because we don't allow um, access without device enrollment. So we'll, we'll kind of get to that as we keep going through these good, better, best. Um, but just, just kind of comparing it to... You know, people ask a lot of times, what's Microsoft do? So for the browser-based access, this is what Microsoft does. Uh, for the mobile devices, Microsoft goes a step further. And if you have been a fan of the show for a while, you might have listened to one of our device management um, episodes where we kind of talked about this good, better, best type scenario where we said maybe you start with MAM as your good and you don't fully manage the device in this particular case. And this is how I think of it too. But of course, each organization is different and how you want to decide. Um, when we were talking about it previously, we we're like, well, if you really want to just kind of step foot into managing data, you could just use MAM and maybe only access email or something like that. But if you needed access to internal applications that require a VPN, then you fully manage it. I just wanted to point out for this, you know, guidance here, and this is usually how I roll, is that really the, the good, the bare minimum is to manage the device. So for iOS devices and Android devices, mobile devices, it does require management. Um, whereas for Windows and Macs, it's not requiring management because it's just accessing the data through the web apps. As we move to the better controls, that's where you are using conditional access to then manage the device. You must be on a compliant device and then you can allow access to those fat clients essentially, right? To be able to have that data within the Outlook application on a Mac or a PC, but that requires enrollment. So using conditional access to do that, um, as well as using Defender for cloud apps, in the documentation, like, like I said, it's a little bit old. They still refer to it as its old name, which is Microsoft Cloud App Security. It's our CASB solution. And that's where you're using access policies within Defender for Cloud Apps as well as session control. And so that is something that not a lot of people do, but super powerful, like what Adam was talking about, is where you can allow different real-time detection of that data that's being transmitted or read and make policy decisions on that. So if it is a managed device, I will allow you to go to the SaaS app 
And it's not just Outlook. It could be Salesforce. You know, there are certain session controls built in for other partners that we have. Um, so Salesforce being one of them, I'll just use that as an example. You can you can go to that, and if it's on a managed device, I'll be able to then download or do whatever with the data. But if it's not, I'm going to allow you read only. And if you do download, maybe I encrypt it on the fly with uh, Microsoft Information Protection. So those are like session controls. It's after authentication. It's looking at the data that's being exchanged during the session. And then Azure Identity Policy uh, Protection Policies. So risk-based conditional access. So looking at that sign-in risk as well as the device risk and making a dynamic decision on whether or not you're going to have access to the uh, the company data. Now, we're talking about all these things. Forgot about mentioned licensing. A lot of this stuff does require the M365 E5 or at least um, yeah, the security SKU. So it does, you know, the full access for uh, Defender for Cloud Apps, um, Azure Active Directory P2, which comes with that risk-based conditional access. Um, so, you know, either a la carte, you can buy those separately for the ones that we talked about here, or you can obviously go with the full E5. So comparing this to the previous, the, this we're now in the better control and we're comparing against the good. What have we added? So... Number one, Andy talked through that conditional access app control that's part of Defender for Cloud Apps. That's that more granular control. So I mentioned with the previous one, the app enforced restrictions, that's just like, you just can't download stuff. You know, you can pretty much do anything else. You can upload all you want. Uh, you can't download anything. With conditional access app control, again, that gives you more granular control where depending on your business, you could potentially restrict certain downloads, but not others. You could potentially um, monitor certain things from being said in chat or uh, th those sorts of scenarios as well. So that's that's one difference. Um, really, the other major one is layering in those identity protection policies. That's where you're looking to see, like, has something changed? Is something anomalous with this user or this individual sign-in? And let's put a more restrictions in place. Now, if you're already requiring an MFA across the board and you should, then what are you, what kind of controls are you doing with this? Probably honestly a block or maybe an enforced self-service password reset, depending on the scenario. So that that's layering in a little additional control here, but, but not a significant amount. And again, these are, this is still BYOD we're talking about on the mobile device. You know, not a whole lot has changed from that perspective. It's still that same idea of application level management, um, managing the app, enforcing those settings at the app level, um, and ensuring conditional access is making sure that you're using a managed app when you come in and all that good stuff. So on the mobile device, not a whole lot has changed other than we're looking at the sign-ins as well um, under this blueprint. And um, then I think once we get to the third one, which I don't want to jump ahead to, but so far I'm pretty good with this. Like this all makes sense. I, I don't think you're adding in a ton of additional controls in the better other than the, that defender for cloud apps, more granular session controls, and then those identity controls, which are, I mean, are valuable. Don't get me wrong. Um, but from a BYOD perspective, we haven't really changed the user experience paradigm a whole lot. Your Mac and PCs are still using the office web apps. Your mobile devices are using the, um, the policy managed uh, mobile apps from Google play or the app store respectively. And I also forgot to mention the common control. So what Adam talked about with MFA across the board, there are some recommendations here for what baseline you should have for across the board. The first one being MFA, right? So you should enable that. If you can do any type of BYOD scenario, you should also block legacy authentication. And then you should use device enrollment restrictions for Intune. And so there are, policies that you can go into Intune and restrict what type of device can be enrolled as well as operating system. Um, you can, for Android, you can block device administrator enrollment. And so that that's like the old way of doing Android and Android devices. There are still a ton of them out there. And this is, you know, I think like anything 8.0 and older um, had 
device administrator, which is where you're actually using an administrator within the device to enroll in, into management. And now they use Android Enterprise, which has a separate workplace profile versus like a personal profile. And so for better or for worse, you know, it, it's a not the greatest user experience. You get used to it, but it's the way that they're doing it now. And it does separate completely your work apps into a separate container a profile that is basically ripped out if you unenroll from management. And so um, that's the way you should manage Android devices. And so you can prevent like certain Android devices from enrolling if they're doing that and um, all sorts of things. So uh, that's also one of the common controls that you should look at. So before you even start enrolling devices, have your enrollment restrictions shored up. The final one that's in here, which I found was really interesting, is they talk about using Azure Virtual Desktop. And the document is actually a little bit older. They talk about they have it as Windows Virtual Desktop. It's been rebranded as Azure Virtual Desktop. And it was actually prior to when Windows 365 went generally available. And so there's no mention of Windows 365, although I would kind of lump those two together in a VDI situation where you're doing that sort of solution and trying to implement it so um, we had a whole episode on windows 365 if you're interested go back and look at that we had bradley dupay who is one of our global black belts um, he's on the incubation team uh, phenomenal uh, resource and if you don't know what it, what it is and how it differs i would definitely go back and listen to that one you'll know after listening uh, to bradley but, you know, both, uh, we won't get into the differences, but both are viable solutions to provide a VDI mm -hmm. to users in a work from home situation, a BYOD situation. I was, you know, my thoughts in general um, is that for sure it is a good way to kind of keep it clean where you're not actually having to enroll the device because, you know, part of what they said here, which I, kind of question is they use conditional access, which you can, you can use conditional access to gate the access to virtual desktop or windows 365. You can use a conditional access rule, but if you're requiring a compliant device to access a VDI, then why not just use the device natively to access what you need to access? Unless you don't have a VPN and your VPN is within the service itself. So you're using like a site to site VPN from Azure that connects your, that Azure VLAN to your, you know, on-premise network. And you're using that to connect back, which is a perfectly viable way to do it. In fact, that's how I do my demo tenant is I have an AVD stood up in my Azure tenant. I don't have VPN enabled on my firewalls at home, but if I travel, I can just connect to my AVD, which has a site to site VPN that connects back to my house through Azure. Um, and I can access my internal network from anywhere. Perfectly good way to implement it. But I find it weird if, if that's not the specific use case and you're just using it to have a managed device and have it secure, why wouldn't you just manage the device itself if you're already requiring a compliant device, right? If it's hybrid Azure AD joint or it's a compl in tune compliant device, why not just have a native instead of standing up a whole ar architecture to do that? Now, if you're using Windows 365 and AVD, you can do conditional access and just say MFA. You must MFA in order to access it. That would negate the... Um, requirement to manage the device which can be a burden off your back because then you don't have to worry about configuration policies in intune for personal devices versus company devices versus deploying applications and all this other stuff um, you could just say yep we're just going to have a golden image or whatever uh, automation to deploy this avd it's it'll spin up with everything you need and you're good to go or windows 365 whatever um, and then you just have to have mfa to access it from any device you know it depends on your risk uh i don't know how i feel about that because you know to what about printing what about um copy and pasting from those you know virtual environments which 
you may or may not want to do depending on your risk appetite. So I, I have a lot of questions about, you know, not to say that VDI isn't a good tool. It can be. I just don't know if it's, the, you know, what they're saying here is the best option. Well, first off, I, I would say there's something in here that's straight up wrong. And so that I completely disagree with. Um, and again, keep in mind, all of this is supposed to be specifically for the BYOD scenario. So I am bringing my own device. So I'm saying, hey, I've got a Macintosh here or I've got a Windows PC. I just bought just bought myself a new Surface laptop. Um, there's a thing in here that says you should require to access that Azure virtual desktop, require a hybrid Azure AD join device. Now I'm sure this is probably just a mistake on the author's part because hybrid join means it's domain joined, like on-premises domain joined. Do not on-premises domain join devices that don't belong to your org. Just don't do that. <laughs> uh, I mean, you would, you just you just wouldn't. I mean, and I don't know of any company that would really consider that anyway. Um, on that note, you really shouldn't Azure AD join devices that don't belong to your org anyway. So I will say just, I'm speaking from experience here. I recently bought myself a personally owned Surface Laptop 4 because um, I'm not going to get a device refresh for a while at Microsoft. And I bought a device that was great during the pandemic. And then I tried to travel with it and realized it's not ideal for that scenario. So I have a 15 inch surface book three, which is a beastly, super powerful device, but it's also heavy and, and large. And I wanted something smaller and easier to travel with. So we do allow BYOD at Microsoft and we can, I could have Azure AD join this device. I chose not to, because when you do that, it does get marked as corporate owned. Um, so I set it up, you know, with my personal Microsoft account or MSA, you may hear them referred to. And then I did, and I don't think it's technically called this anymore, but we still call it this workplace join. Um, it's where you go into like connect to work or school in the, the windows settings app. And that's just basically like enrolling an MDM essentially, you know, equivalent of that, like on a mobile device. And so that's what it does. It goes out, talks to Intune, downloads a bunch of policy, your device becomes compliant, and then you're good to go to access work resources. It's still a personally owned device. It's still set up with my Microsoft account, my personal MSA. However, it is allowed to access corporate resources on in the Microsoft tenant now. So again, all that's to say like hybrid join is the wrong approach. Even Azure AD join is the wrong approach for BYOD. And again, I don't know if we call it this today, but essentially what you would want to do in that scenario would be workplace join is the correct solution. However, to Andy's point and security professionals know this, and we've known this for a long time, VDI is a super secure solution from a security perspective, because the only thing transmitted over the network are literally like images of the screen and mouse clicks and keyboard strokes. It's super secure. You have no risk of data leakage. You have no risk of uh, practically anything because you don't, you don't have like the device that's that the user is using, none of the factors of it are connecting back into your network either. So you don't have the risk of like, well, their filthy PC connected to our network and you know send a bunch of worms to it. Like it doesn't work that way because you have that barrier with VDI. So the idea of requiring a managed device to access a VDI to me is bonkers. Like that's way overkill. Unless you are an extremely and I mean extremely security um, or regulatory environment where that's required. And I, I honestly can't think of a scenario where it, it really adds security benefit like that. That to me just doesn't make sense. I love the idea of for the lowest risk and the best controls, essentially just funneling people through a Windows 365 environment, cloud PC. Yeah, that is a super secure way to deliver access to BYOD. People don't always love that. And I mean, that's a little bit of a cop out because you can deliver BYOD, but it does get messier with doing management and that sort of thing. I mean, you have to have expertise in that and, and definitely put enough controls in place without going too far. And, and to be fair as well, there is a, a certain amount of um, like user education and user responsibility. I mean, I think theoretically with this personally owned service laptop I was talking about, I think there would be opportunity for me to, to do, you know, 
take information from Microsoft and, and do bad things with it. If I was really determined, I probably get caught after the fact, but you know, there are, there are limitations on how much controls you can put in place in that scenario. So maybe that's why this isn't offered up here, but um, you know, I, I still think if you want a complete BYOD solution, basically punting on managing Macs and PCs is like you, you didn't really solve for it. You kind of delivered a, you know, a web experience or a VDI experience, which are good experiences, but they're not the same as native. Um, so this, 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 but that's more complicated. And the whole point of this is a simple blueprint to get you started. And that's what this does. So not, not picking this apart because this is super good, but in the best controls, when you see this documentation and you're reviewing it after the show, just know Ignore that part about hybrid Azure AD join <laughs> required for the VDI. And, and then I think we're pretty much in agreement here. Um, also, just to mention, this still doesn't change anything about the mobile devices. So for the most part, the mobile device doesn't really change from the good, better, and best. It's all the same scenario where we're delivering those applications with those mobile application management policies, and we're doing that across the board. And what that makes a really interesting point is that how mature the capabilities are on mobile device platforms, where if you just deliver the outlook app, you have access to a list of settings a mile long to prevent inappropriate data sharing and data leakage. And all your end users have to do is literally just go download outlook from the app store or from Google play and sign in with their creds. And all the rest happens automatically with just setting up the right policy on your end. So that's super slick. Like that's, that's kind of the underlying point here too. It's like, this is really easy to solve on mobile. It's actually these desktop class PCs that are trickier to solve for because they have more complexity. They have more attack surface. There's just more buttons to push and levers to pull. Yeah. Or you can also require outlook to be, installed and then it'll actually download and install for you automatically once you enroll mm -hmm. in uh in tune i will say just as a slight tangent a very very niche use case for a managed device with a vdi is a saw or a paw yes where the managed portion the native portion is actually super super locked down with only access to say the AVD portion or the Windows 365 portion to then be like your user authentication, right? That's where you're gonna check your emails and all of that in the VDI environment, but your native one is the saw or paw where you're doing your administration. That's an interesting way to accomplish that because in the past you would actually done like, I almost said nested virtualization, but not quite, but you know, your, your paw itself was the base OS that was really locked down. And then you ran like your productivity OS in a VM on your hardware. Well, instead that's just easier to just run that as a cloud PC. I mean, it's going to be the same experience practically either way. It's just not running on your hardware, which depending on the hardware you got might be a blessing. <laughs> Right. Like it, it depends, right? If you're, if it's like an on-prem, like I was talking, actually talking with Alex Weinhardt about this because at Microsoft, I'm sure we actually have different administrators for on-prem environment than the administrators for our Azure tenant, right? They're not, they're not the same people. Um, whereas at most organizations, you probably have the same people who are domain admins who are also global admins. And so, my question was like, do you have a lockdown device for only domain administration and then another Azure AD join device for cloud administration? And then you also have your user device as well. So now like, you know, those admins have three devices that are different uh, for different things. Um, and he was like, no, I mean, you can lock down a device to say, just manage Azure and uh, or go to that and then also have like domain administration. So there's ways to lock it down. Um, but I just wanted to get his feedback. And that was one of the questions that I asked him. Um, and then of course, like, you know, you could just restrict access just to AVD or the windows 365 service to get your VDI. And then within there is your productivity. So, um, I just thought that was a, a, a good tangent. Um, one of the use cases that kind of popped into my head where this managed device using a VDI within there may be applicable. Mm-hmm. 
So hopefully you guys take a look at this documentation. Like I said, we're, it's a very, very good blueprint and there's a lot of good things to take away. Um, certainly, you know, I'm not trying to like bash anything that's in it. I just wanted to have a, a conversation about it. Cause you know, I think some things are more up for debate, um, depending on how you look at it. So, um, yeah. So take a look at it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I wasn't bashing it either. Although I, I, I actually will bash the hybrid Azure AD join thing, but that's probably just a typo or a mistake. Um, no, the rest of it's really good as a blueprint and as a roadmap for what to do. And then the other thing too, while I love the native experience, I completely acknowledge that's a ton of complexity, like a ton. And there's a reason most orgs have never bitten that off. And I, and I realize, you know, Microsoft is not most orgs, right? I mean, it's 200,000 people. So there's, there's a lot of money and expertise to be able to stand something like that up. Um, we are very fortunate to be able to enroll our personally on Macintoshes or our personally on Windows devices and have them be able to access company resources. And I think there's some level of trust involved in that scenario too, um, to be good stewards of the data. Because again, I don't think there's technical controls for absolutely everything to create that perfect separation on Mac or PC, like there is on mobile devices, like we pointed out, you know, on mobile, this is pretty much solved in the good controls and that just carries over across the whole thing. So it's a good debate to have. And I think really cloud PCs enable um, some really, really good use cases there, but keep in mind, VDI is still challenging for a lot of people to understand. I mean, the plot of inception is really difficult for people to understand as well. Like it's a machine within a machine, man. And it's, it's tricky to understand. I, I supported a bunch of wise terminals at like my first help desk job and for, for a bunch of like insurance agents. And I can tell you, they did not understand why can't I plug in a flash drive and move a file from the flash drive to my desktop or put it on the flash drive. Well, that's a, that's a virtual desktop and it doesn't work that way. And, you know, maybe if you mount the device, it'll show up here in device manager and blah, blah, blah. like just that was too much. Now I think it's easier today with, everything being cloud, especially if your company, you know, keeps everything in team SharePoint and OneDrive and you have the OneDrive sync client set up, especially with like known folder, known folder move, you know, you can make that pretty seamless today and maybe overcome some of those challenges. But keep in mind, if you still do a lot of like on-prem network shares or God forbid, you still have a lot of flash drives floating around your environment. Like people don't get how VDI works. It still has rough edges and it's great from a security perspective, but it still has challenges from a user experience perspective, unless you're like all in on the cloud, you know? So just some things to think about. And that's our show for this week. Thanks for listening and watching our contact information will be in the show notes. If you have any questions, comments, or topics you want us to talk about on future shows. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.